Let's just stop for a moment and focus on the Lord for just a moment if we could and just be silent then before him. Thank you, Lord, for your mercy, for your grace, for your goodness. We thank you, Lord, that you're God. You're worthy to be praised, to be honored, and be glorified. And, Lord, we know that so many times each and every one of us face walls of uncertainty, walls of difficulty, walls that sometimes seem overwhelming. And we know that the only thing that we can do as we face those times of tribulation in our life is just to praise you, to glorify you, and to lift you up. Lord, outside these walls, there's a world that's filled with chaos and confusion and tribulation. And many of us will go to those places tomorrow of work and school and wherever it may be. We face the onslaught of Satan, the temptations of the world that are so real and uh, so evident, Lord, every day that we live. And Lord, I'm glad and grateful that you said greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. And Lord, we're long overdue of just praising you and exalting you and giving you glory uh, in the house of God. Again, Lord, I pray that uh, you just bless this service. Lord, uh, encourage us. Lord, there's somebody that came in here tonight defeated and discouraged. And Lord, they did need lifting up and encouraging tonight. And Lord, you know, it may be more than one, but Lord, whoever it might be, I pray you'd speak to them, Lord, and encourage them tonight through a song, uh, through whatever needs to be done. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. First Kings chapter 18. The Lord's laid this message on my heart. It's not a new message, but it's very challenging. It's a passage of scripture that seems to be burning this evening. And, um, we've been thinking about revival lately, about this tent meeting. and Revival is such a great need around us. And uh, no greater ministries than that of Elisha and Elijah. And uh, we look and we see some things in this text. And uh, it's read verse 17 through verse 24. And then we'll read verse 36 through verse 40. In verse 17 it says, It came to pass when Ahab saw Elijah, that Ahab said unto him, Art thou he that troubleth Israel? And he answered, I have not troubled Israel, but thou and thy father's house, in that ye have forsaken the commandments of the Lord, and thou hast followed Balaam. Now therefore send and gather to me all Israel unto Mount Carmel, and the prophets of Baal four hundred and fifty, and the prophets of the groves four hundred, which eat at Jezebel's table. So Ahab sent unto the children of Israel, and gathered the prophets together unto Mount Carmel. And Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And all the people answered him not a word. Then said Elijah unto the people, I even I only remain a prophet of the Lord, but Baal's prophets are 450 men. Let them therefore give us two bullocks, and let them choose one bullock for themselves and cut it in pieces, and lay it on wood and put no fire under. And I'll dress the other bullock and lay it on wood and put no fire under. Verse 24, and, when you, and you call on the name of your gods, and I'll call on the name of the Lord, and the God that answers by fire, let him be God. And all the people answered and said, it is well spoken. Verse 36. And it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Israel, let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel and that, that I am thy servant and that what I have done, all these things at thy word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that thou art the Lord God and thou hast turned their heart back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. When all the people saw it, they fell on their face and they said, The Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. If the fire is going to fall. Uh, if we think about this passage, he, we, it has its setting when the spiritual tide of Israel is really, it's extre uh, really extremely low ebb. 
the people have for the most part turned their backs on the Lord and they've gone after the Canaanite god Baal, which we know that uh, that's more of a success uh, God, as we looked at this morning. And against the backdrop of apostasy and idolatry, the prophet Elijah strolls on the stage and he's actually introduced in chapter 17, verse 1. Uh, when he makes his appearance, he comes with a message from the Lord and it's a clarion call for repentance and, and for a renewal to the loyalty of Jehovah God. And as you look further into this passage, we find that uh, it, things begin to come to a head. On one hand, we have uh, there's, a, uh, there's a nation uh, that's godless. Uh, on the other hand, we have uh, uh, Elijah and Jehovah, uh, and the odds are stacked in favor of evil. There's no doubt about that. It seems like it's overwhelming. But Elijah is about to experience the truth of the matter that one plus God is a majority. I like what Ed Setzer one time, who led the Sunday school board, uh, he said churches need to remember that a certain size of a church is not the goal, being healthy is, amen? And I still believe that. I believe there's nothing like a healthy church. And a healthy church is much greater if you've got 50 people that are dedicated and faithful to the things of God than you've got 500 that are living like the world and you can't have any, there's not any distinguishment in their lives. So thank you for being faithful, by the way. Hey, we're one of the few churches around here that still have Sunday night services in this county. And people are driving here to come to our service. And I'm not criticizing their church. There's Baptist churches and there's all different denominations of churches. But some folks say, well, I go by there and there's all kinds of cars. What are you doing over there? I said, we're just preaching. We're just honoring God. I said, we're doing what we're supposed to be doing. Amen. Amen. Thank you for being faithful. But if you understand this, this text, these people have fallen a long way uh, from the nation that had entered and conquered Canaan hundreds of years before. Uh, now they're politically divided and they become an apostate nation. <laughs> Almost sounds like us, doesn't it? And Obadiah and Elijah uh, served God in a time when openly serving God was a very dangerous thing. And folks, it's getting almost about that way now, even around us. They need the fire to fall. And I ask myself, are we any different? Do we not need the fire to fall again in our churches? Do we need the fire of God to fall uh, in revival? Do we need the fires of revival to fall again uh, in this tent meeting? I believe we do. I <clears throat> reminded what Dr. Tony Evans said. He said, many people want God to bless America today, but don't want one nation under God. How true that is. It's, uh, I go on, he said this, when the richest nation in the world is unable to pay its bills, having to bail everyone out while simultaneously legislating immorality with its prisons full to overflowing, while its schools lose its students by droves, and we just think it's bad loans, bad politicians, or a bad culture. He says, we've missed it. It's about God shaking things up and help us in understanding that he alone is God. You know, our biggest problem today is we don't relate anything to God. We don't relate anything to God. I like what uh, Gaither said. Gaither said the things that make our nation great are faith, family, and freedom. And that's still, still so true. Uh, I wonder sometimes have we not become so anesthetized by religion uh, that we've been lulled to sleep by ritual. As I look across America, I'm reminded of the story that I read uh, about Yosemite National Park. Each year they'll go around, they get all the fallen trees and the branches that had been damaged and fallen to the ground because of snow and ice, wind, or whatever. And they take all those things and build a huge bonfire. And uh, a bulldozer will be called by the park service to come. And a bit, those big, huge trees, all the, none of the limbs with the trees and everything would be, begin to pile up. And they would wait once a year. And, and they would bring that bulldozer, and he'd wait to hear the command of the people. People would travel for miles around to watch this, these big, massive timbers uh, roll over the ledge. And in, in unison, they would come to that place when the bulldozer would crank his engine and he'd get ready to pull them off of that, into, off of that pile he'd say, and, they, and set them on fire. They would yell in unison, let the fire fall. Well, it was several years later, uh, a man who had heard about that, uh, that, they were going, that they were still doing it, and he so thought. Uh, he had made the trip before, and it was so interesting that he showed up again, but there was nobody there. And the park ranger came out, and he said, sir, he said, I'm sorry, the fire doesn't fall here anymore. Isn't that mostly the story of most of our churches, the fire doesn't fall here anymore. 
I remember last night, I was th refer looking back, and I know we can't live in the past, but I remember going, growing up and coming through revival meetings, sometimes when 15, 20 people would come to Christ. I remember seeing sometimes five uh, young men called to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, and they would go into the pastor. You're not seeing that anymore. I can't hardly even find anybody to fill in for me anymore. I'm glad we got some great Bible teachers here I have to call on. We've got men today. we got guys that aren't credible. They don't go to church unless they're going to preach. Uh, some of them don't go to church unless so half the time uh, they, they social drink and they live like the devil and then they expect God to bless them in the pulpit it just don't go with this old preacher amen there's some things I'm going to stick to and there's some things I'm going to hold to and I'm not compromising from them and I believe that and I'm set on that amen we need some men in their generation to stand and preach the word of God we need the fire of God to fall again on our nation and I believe it's going to start with our pulpits amen you see it's tragic it's a tragic but true word uh, about a lot of our churches. The fire just doesn't fall here anymore. And folks, if there's anything we need, we need the fires of revival to fall. We're known now as the ungeneration. We've got the ungeneration, the unchurched, unaffiliated, uninterested in anything to do with church. And as a matter of fact, it goes so far that we're considered ungodly. We've got ungodliness all around us. Well, as we look at this story, Look, what, what is he going to take to get the fire to fall again in our churches and in America and in our community? First of all, uh, there's going to have to be a confrontation. There's going to be, have to be a confrontation with at least three things you see in this scripture. First of all, there, needs to be a, there has to be a confrontation with a faithless generation. If I were to give you a bunch of statistics tonight, it's just amazing to, to think about the people that don't even believe in God anymore. Uh, the universities that once were held Judeo-Christian principles now have cast doubts on the Word of God and they mess with young students' minds about creation and, and, and all the other things that go along with that. And they try to introduce the Big Bang Theory and evolution and all these other things. And they try to tie in creation with evolution. Folks, you've got to believe one or the other. Either God did it or He didn't do it. I believe God did it based on the authority of the Word of God. There's just some things I look around today and see they are unexplainable except for God to have done it. Amen? Amen. A faithless generation. Uh, as you go back to that generation, look for just a moment what was happening there. Ahab had allowed his wife to bring the worship of Baal into Israel as the Zidonians, uh, the, that being Jezebel. Uh, she was determined to rid the worship of Jehovah. As you look back to chapter 18, uh, Ahab said, okay, I, Jezebel, I, I'm going to build you a private temple where you can worship Baal. <laughs> he was such a wimp. Uh, he, he jumped at every, her every whim. Uh, her ultimate goal, ladies and gentlemen, was to exterminate the worshipers of Jehovah God and have all the people of Israel serving Baal. Baal was the fertility god, as I mentioned this morning, who was known to send rain in a time of famine so that they could have successful, bountiful crops. And the rites connected with worship were unspeakably immoral. Sort of like a lot of what's going on around America today in the name of Christianity. Folks, it is sad. Some of the people have given their money, their time, their efforts to make sure that they, they're in a denomination that, that, that honors God. And, and many of them today are having to leave their denominations because they've gone so worldly and so carnal, allowing things of the world to overcome the church. And it's knocking at our door as well every day that we live. A faithless generation. Then secondly, he's here in the midst. There, there, there has to be a confrontation. That's where he's at. That's why all, that's the surface of, all, of, of uh, Jezebel. That's the surface of Ahab. There's their mentality. They have no respect for the man of God. They have no respect for the things of God. Uh, their, worship, their worship is that of a pagan god. A godless system. And they have the backing to prove. They have a religious backing. Uh, notice they have the prophets of Baal. The religious system, per se, of that day. The professional clergy, we might say, who were on their side. Why? Because it was ran by the government. A faithless generation. There has to be a confrontation, ladies and gentlemen, today with a faithless generation. And we're in that confrontation. For the one, one year to the next, when you call a preacher, now, and you don't realize this sometimes, 
I don't know sometimes if I can even call on the same guy I called on last time because of some of the things that are bombarding preachers and pastors and pulling them away from the basic principles of God's word. A faithless generation. A faithless government. They're facing a faithless government. And you know as well as I do, you and I today, as we sit in this church, we're facing a faithless government. Oh, God help us for the, some of the ideologies and some of the things today that are being passed forward and, and legislated in our country. So pathetic. It breaks your heart. There has to be a confrontation of that. And then thirdly, there was a confrontation with a false god. Folks, there's so many people. There's a lot of people who say we believe in God, but the only problem is, folks, uh, listen, the God they believe in is not the same God of the Bible. <laughs> That's the problem. And we've raised a culture who believes in God, but it's not the same God of this Bible. Because their God, they say, allows anything. You can live anyway, do anything you want. Uh, and that's the philosophy. Well, God's a God of love, and God, God doesn't wouldn't like it if uh, he has no his feelings aren't hurt, or he's not objective, uh, or objects if I do something in this way or this caliber of life. Folks, this this the ideologies have totally changed in our culture. Folks, we need the fire to fall again on our churches. A confrontation. A confrontation is necessary if the fire is going to fall. A confrontation was, was evident there uh, in the life of Elijah if the fire was going to fall. There had to be a confrontation with these prophets of Baal and the things that Jezebel and Ahab were putting them up to. And let me just say this. As you think about your life and my life, you're not going to live for Christ very long and not have a confrontation with, with this world and the flesh and the devil. Because there's a system... A system that hates you, hates the church, hates anything about Christ, hates anything about the Bible. And listen, they'll do anything they can to disguise. And folks, I'm not even going to mention right now from up here some things that I've heard that have been seen locally on Facebook that are getting ready to take place here in, a, in, a, in this area. But we better be disturbed. We better be disturbed due to some of the planning that's going on for the city of Avamara. We need to pray for a dose of God to move over his place and some folks get saved. I'll be honest with you. There's some things that are happening all around us and some agendas being promoted. Some of you have seen it on Facebook. I know you have. It's wrong. It'll always be wrong. And it'll never be right. It's always sin. And it leads to harm. It leads to destruction. And it destroys the family. And it destroys a community. Secondly, if the fire is going to be fall, there's going to be a confrontation. There has to be confidence. There's going to be confidence. Not self-confidence. There has to be confidence. There has to be confidence in God. Listen, if somebody said he may not keep us from the war, but he'll, keep us, he'll help us win the battle. Amen? Keep in mind that this, this era uh, was, was op when openly serving the Lord was a dangerous thing. Uh, there were, were they afraid? Were they ashamed or what? Look at verse 21. Elijah came and he to all the people and he said, How long halt you between two opinions? He said, If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. He said, Are you going to, are you going to pro follow these false prophets? Are you going to follow the false prophets that Ahab has raised up? Are you going to, uh, going to follow all these prophets that eat at Jezebel's table? Or are you going to follow God? Who are you going to follow? You, how long halt you between two opinions? How long are you going to straddle the fence, he says? If the Lord be God, he said, follow him. If he's your Savior, if he's Lord, if he's the King of kings, if he's the great I am, if he saved you by his grace, follow him. But if you're going to follow Baal, if you're going to follow the world or other gods, if you're going to follow the world system, then follow him. You've got to make up your mind. There's no middle road, he says. And there's still no middle road for us. Either you're going to live for God or you're not going to live for God. I'm convinced that some folks I don't think have made up their mind yet. And the people answered him, not a word. Interesting statement. Why? What's that all about? You know what they did? They gave him the silent treatment. Preacher, that's just your opinion. I got mine. <laughs> that's what we hear today. Well, brother, you got your opinion and I got mine. Nowhere in the Bible does it says do not do this and not do that. Listen, 
the Bible doesn't give you, there are some things that are maybe gray, but there's a clear-cut message for most of the things that we conquer today and we deal with. But that's the attitude of most people today. He, in this confrontation, they gave him the silent treatment. You see, verse 21, he says, How much longer will you waver hobbling between two opinions? These, the people were silent. <laughs> they, really do, they, were, they were really saying, We just won't, don't want to get involved. We don't want to get involved. We believe we'll just let you handle it, Elijah. We don't want to get involved. After all, there's force behind that group of prophets. After all, they've got Ahab and Jezebel on, the, Jezebel on their side, and we know what they've done to those who opposed in the past. Folks, Ron Dunn said, some people would say, boy, God's really started working in Elisha's life. He said, what we really mean is he started working in the way we expected him to. But sometimes the very things that cause us to believe God is not at, is not at work constitutes the very work God's doing. <laughs> Sometimes we can't always see the hand of God in something, but he's always behind the scenes working. You see, these folks went from silence to suspicion. You see, Elijah's goal was not to expose the false gods of Baal, to, but to bring a compromising people back to Jehovah God. That was the real issue of what he was doing. As you look at verse 37, he said, Hear me, O Lord, hear me that this people may know that thou art the Lord God and thou hast turned their heart back again. The very reason that he wanted something to transpire in the confrontation between the, the prophet, himself and the prophets of Baal, the very reason he's getting ready to do everything he does on this altar, as they begin to, as they begin to come out, and they, he said, okay, God led him and, inst and, and directed him, and as he makes this confrontation, he has confidence in God, so much confidence in God that we see what he does. And you know the story. Uh, the Bible says that he uh, came to this place, uh, and he says, he said, therefore, give us two bullets and let them choose the bullet for themselves and cut it in pieces. He said, and you guys lay it on wood and put no fire under it. And he says, I'm going to dress the other bullet and, and lay it on wood and put no fire under it. We, we got an even match here, okay? He says, you put up your sacrifice, I'll put up mine. He said, you start calling on the name of your God and I'll call on the name of, of the Lord. And whichever God answers by fire, paraphrasing, he said, let him be God. And all the people answered, and they said, okay, we'll do that. Uh, they had confidence in their God. And Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, he said, choose you one bullock for yourselves and dress it first, for there's a lot of you, uh, and, and call on the name of your gods, but put no fire under. Uh-oh, we got a problem. They got to have fire. Well, where are they going to get their fire from? And they took the bullock which was given them and they dressed it and called on the name of the bell from morning, even, from morning even unto noon. And they said, Oh, bell, hear us. But there was no voice <laughs> nor any that answered. And they leaped upon the altar which was made. It came to pass at noon that Elijah mocked them. <laughs> and he said, Cry aloud, for he is a God. Notice what he says in little G-O-D. He said, either he's talking, uh, you can't get his attention, he's occupied right now, he's talking to somebody else. Aren't you glad we serve a God that can listen to me and he can listen to you? He can hear all of us at the same time. He's omniscient, amen. amen. Or he is pursuing, he's using the bathroom is what that literally means, or he's in a journey or per bench, or he's, he's, just, he's asleep and you need to wake him up. And they cried aloud and they cut themselves after their manner with knives and lancet to the blood gushed out upon them came to pass when midday was past that they prophesied under the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice and there was neither voice nor any to answer nor any that regarded no response in either direction when Elijah came to all the people came near and, and all the people came near unto him and he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down and he took twelve stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob unto whom the word of the Lord came saying Israel shall be, by, be thy name and he took those stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord and he made a trench about the altar as great as would contain two measures of seed several gallons of seed 
And he put the wood in order and he cut the bullock in pieces. He laid it on, uh, on the wood and he said, fill four barrels of water and pour it on the burnt sacrifice and on the wood. He did it a second time. He said, I want you to do it the third time. The Bible says in verse 35, and the water ran about the altar and it filled the trench with the water. We're looking at something God-sized, aren't we? You know what Elijah's saying? Elijah's saying, listen, if God doesn't do this, it won't get done. Elijah said, if the fire is going to fall, it's not something I can work up. If, if the fire is going to fall, it's not something that I can do or some kind of trickery that I can use. and no magical trick. If the fire is going to fall and the only one that's ever going to get credit for it is going to be God. And folks, if we ever have revival, it's not going to be for my credit, your credit, or Ralph Sexton's credit. It's going to be because a holy God pours out his glory on this county and on this church and on their, our churches. said it came... I love this story. It came to pass at the time of the offering, the evening sacrifice. Elijah came near and he said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Israel. Notice the rest of this verse in verse 36. Let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel. That's the purpose of what he's doing, folks. He wants them to know that there is a God in Israel, a God that's not dead, a God that has power. Folks, there's a world out here. They need to know that we serve a true and living God by the way that we live. They need to know that we serve a God that loves us. We, they need to know that there's a God that loves them because he loves us and we love them. They need to know, no, we don't love sin, but we love the sinner. Amen? He said, let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel, and thy, I am thy servant. <laughs> See, he wasn't showing off or showing his great abilities. It was all about who God was, and he was just being obedient. But notice he says, and that I am thy servant. And he goes on and he says, that, and that I have done all these things at thy word. In other words, he says, you let them know that I, and not only the prophets of Baal, not only those that are watching, but the people of God that have watched this, let them know, let them know that it's not... It's not from my glory. Know that I've done all these things because you've told me to do these things. He wanted to give the credit to God. He didn't dream up what he was supposed to do. He just did simply what God told him to do one step at a time as he progressed forward. That's all he wants us to do, folks. He wants us to progress forward in our Christian life, to go one day at a time, one step at a time. And he wants to work in and through our lives so that he can get the glory. And so he'll tell us and he'll lead us and guide us on what to do. But there has to be a confrontation. There has to be confidence. But, folks, there has to be a commitment. There has to be a commitment in verse 38 and verse 39. He said, hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people will know that thou art the Lord God and that thou hast turned their heart back again. Sounds like revival to me, don't it you? Sounds like revival to me. They've seen what God could do. And he begins to pray. And he said, oh God, hear me, that this people may know. They had forgotten. They had forgotten. Because of the pressures and all the tactics of Jezebel and Ahab, they have forgotten the love of God and their dedication to a holy God. Therefore, his desire through all of this is for them to see that God has their interest at heart. And he said, hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that thou art the Lord God. Folks, every now and then, you know what? We need to be, be, need to be reminded that he's God. Amen. He's God. He hasn't gone anywhere. He knows exactly what's going on in our culture. He knows what's going on in the city. He knows what's going on in your life. He knows what's going on in my life. He knows what's going on all around us. He, he's not asleep. He neither slumbers nor sleeps. And it looks like the Satan's having a, a heyday and he's having a wonderful time. But listen, let me just say his time is limited at working and operating this world. One day he's going to face the judgment of God and he's going to be bound in the eternal pits of hell and he'll be inoperative forever. He knows that. He knows that. And he wants to damage us and ruin our relationship and fellowship as much as he can because he can't have it. He'll never be able to have it. He said that thou, the Lord, and that thou hast turned their heart back again. Notice what he's doing. He wants them to renew their commitment to a fearful God. We see the people's reaction. Uh, as you look at verse 38, Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. I could just see it now. I just, just like a vacuum. God just licked it up. 
and the altar was consumed. But look at verse 39. And when all the people saw it, can't help but to see their reaction. Notice it says they fell on their faces. When you understand and you realize that you've just experienced God and not something only God can do, you can't help but to fall on your face in worship. Amen. When you stop and think about where God's done in your life, what he's done in your life, where he's brought you from, uh, hey, there's nothing else you can do sometimes but just fall prostrate <clears throat> on your face toward him and stop and react in a way. They fell on their faces. They fell on their faces. And folks, it would be to do us good to fall on our faces again and just give him glory and give him honor and, thank, and humble ourselves of the fact of what he's done for us. But the fire of God has fell on our hearts and our lives in salvation. When they saw it, they fell on their faces. And look what they said. We see not only what they, the reaction, but look at their reply. The Lord, He is God. Notice the capital L-O-R-D. Because it's significant. Jehovah. Jehovah God. Sovereign God. The Lord, He is the God. Hey, Almost a little slang there, amen. He, he didn't say they, he didn't say he is a god. You see, they've seen what the gods of Baal could do, uh, all the other gods, but we've seen what the God can do, the only God, the only true and the living God. Uh, he is the God. And by the way, let me just say tonight like once again, he is the only true and living God. He is the mediator between us and Christ Jesus the Lord, or Jesus is the mediator between us and God the Father. And we understand tonight as we think about that verse that he is the God, the Lord, he is the God. He said that twice. That was his reply. You know what he was saying? He was saying he is the great I am. He is the great I am. If you want to know who the great I am, you've forgotten who the great I am is. And you've just seen the response and the reaction of a holy God as he's consumed this sacrifice and he's, and he's, and he's burning up. I've doused it with water. I've drenched it and so that it's an impossible task. But the God that you've just seen that we serve can accomplish impossible tasks. And they all understood that he is the God. He is the God. You see, the fires of judgment had to come on the altars of, of drink. Elisha later on in this chapter goes to pray. Uh, and Elisha, as he went to pray, he sent a servant out seven times to see if it was raining. Uh, and he'd been praying for rain. And finally, uh, he went out there the seventh time and he saw a little cloud about the size of, of a man's hand rising from the sea. You see, although he seemed outnumbered on so many occasions, overwhelmed, discouraged, and defeated, he was constantly reminded in the steadfast things of God. And all these different things that we're seeing in these couple chapters here point us to several truths. Is this. We need the fire of God to fall on our lives again, folks. We need the fire of God to fall on our homes. We need the fire of God to fall on our community. We need the fires of God to fall on our church. We need the fires of God to fall on our nation. If the fire is going to fall again, we're going to have to do these things. They're going to have to be a confrontation. We're going to have to com have a confrontation with, with, with faith unfaithfulness. We're going to have to have a confrontation uh, with the lack of faith. We're going to have to have a confrontation with, with a with a false teachings of this generation and the false gods that are being promoted all around us. We have to have confidence again. I think during COVID there's something that's happened to the confidence of God's people. I'm hearing daily, I, some folks visit me today. And I'm not saying this to be negative, I'm just being realistic, okay? You wouldn't believe the guys that are in ministry that are dropping like flies. Just walking off the scene. Going back to public jobs, going other directions, doing things. Back in my hometown, just one after another. The pressures have become so overwhelming for a lot of pastors because, because of pe people pressure, public pressure, financial pressures. I could go on with different scenarios. And I, I sit back and I'm looking. And let, let me encourage you. To, you don't have to necessarily encourage me because you do that. Find somebody to encourage. There's some pastors around here who are going through some tough times. 
Encourage them. Pray for them. Lift them up. I spend time with a lot of them. And I know some of the battles and struggles they face. There's a lot of them would love to have a, Wednesday, a Sunday night service. I had one tell me recently that I, during COVID, their deacons came and said, Pastor, we just want you to know that when uh, things are starting to ease up a little bit, but we've already decided we don't want to have Sunday night service again. The people have spoken. What's he to do? Is he to leave? Is he to stay? He's struggling. Have another gentleman in the same situation. They said, Preacher, whatever you do, we're not having a Wednesday night service. We've never had a Wednesday night service, and we're not going to have a Wednesday night service. You can do what you want to, but we're not having a Wednesday night service. That's where we're at, folks. Thank you for being committed, folks. I appreciate I really do. I appreciate your commitment. And I can brag on you before other people. I, I'm so proud of you guys. I'm glad you let me preach. Amen. Thank you. I'm glad you take care of us. And I'm glad you're committed. And it's a blessing. And I, I'm overwhelmed sometimes. I'm privileged. But there's some guys out there struggling, folks. And I don't tell you those stories. I, I don't name them because it's real. I don't want them to be embarrassed. And you know some of them probably. Let me encourage you. If you know somebody led you to the Lord, somebody's still in ministry, go out of your way to let them know that you, that you appreciate them. Let them know that you care about them. They may not hear it where they're serving. Okay? Do that for me, will you? Please do it for the Lord. Do it for them. There's some questions we got to ask ourselves tonight about this fire falling. Will you be a spiritual hero just like Elisha was and stand against the heresy and apostasy of our day? Will you give your full allegiance to the Lord and stand unashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ for your children's sake and for your grandchildren's sake? Will you flee evil and pursue righteousness for God's glory and for God's honor? Do you need to renew your commitment by, place, by placing him above all the other things in your life? You see, that's exactly what happened in this text. Elijah could have very well been embarrassed when he called that fire down. But he trusted so much in God. He said, God, I want them to know that you are the Lord. I want them to know that you are the Lord. You are the Lord. That's why he did what he did under the leadership of God. It wasn't to show off. It wasn't to show his great abilities as a prophet of God. It was to bring glory and honor to God. And folks, if the fire is going to fall in my life and your life, we've got to be willing to give glory and honor to none other than the Lord Jesus Christ, God's Son, just to give him glory and let him reign and let him rule in our lives on a daily basis. Amen. Let him rule and reign in this church and let him be the head of the church. Amen. Amen. Let's all stand tonight, Danny, if you'll come and play. I don't know where you're at tonight in your walk with the Lord. This is the message I felt compelled to preach tonight. I wonder tonight, maybe you need to just come fall on your face and just say, Lord, thank you for saving me. Maybe you just need to come and get rekindled tonight. You need the fire to fall on your life again tonight. You need to take a little trip back to when God saved you. And reflect for just a moment. And just get rekindled. And say, Lord, I just don't have that fervent spirit that I used to have. I don't have that excitement. There needs to be a confrontation with myself tonight, first of all. And I need to respond. I need to repent. I need confidence again in a faithful God. I need to renew my commitment tonight to a holy God. If we're ever going to have revival, that's exactly why it has to take place with every one of us individually. We have to confront ourselves. We have to have confidence in God. And we have to have a commitment to what God wants to do in and through our lives. Father, thank you for your word. Speak to our hearts. Help us now 
We've heard from heaven through this scripture. What a great, great passage of scripture it is. And how challenging, how convicting. God, let us see your work in and through our lives during this invitation. In Jesus' name, amen.